Yes, I am back. And I do have a new wardrobe. Thank you, my dear. All right, let's get into it. So, The Witcher was never really a series I cared much for. I don't dislike the world, as there are elements I do have an appreciation for, but the way its world has been relayed through Netflix has fallen harder than a paraplegic down the stairs. I never watched the second season, even all this time later, because the first season was like all the hype you try to sell your hookup on before she learns the inevitable truth. And since The Witcher fandom hasn't had its testicles kicked into its Adam's apple enough with the impending downgrade of Cavill to the Hemsworth that no one cares about, Netflix has decided to pull out the bad dragon toy called The Witcher Blood Origin. A prequel series set 1,200 years before the events of The Witcher, when an empire unified the three nations in a way that people disagreed with, so the new empire had to be toppled. And quickly, before we begin, please subscribe to join my kingdom and to share this out, for the king has returned. Now, we open with a battle between humans and elves, and Yaskir is caught up in the middle of this battle, and we are off to a great start when the first two minutes of this limited series' dialogue is 99% F-bombs. Just before someone is about to split his head open like a watermelon, everyone just stops moving and another Yaskir pops up. They have a quick chat where Yaskir tries to figure out whom, or rather, what this being is. And with zero explanation whatsoever, Yaskir is then teleported to a different forest that looks like it was plagiarized straight out of Oblivion's Aelid ruins. This being tells Yaskir she brings back stories when they are needed most, and in this case, the toppling of an empire by seven warriors in a time shortly after the conjunction of the spheres and the origins of the first Witcher. Because for some reason, this is absolutely necessary. So this unknown being then rattles off the names of the main characters in just as forced and clunky an opening as Skyrim's intro. We have Fjall, Sian, Brother Death, Zacher, Sindril, a dwarf named Meldoff, the Lark. Sure, Mara, Debella, Kinnereth, Akatosh, Divines, please help me. Yeah, that's a lot of names. So, in the land of Enos Dub, the Lark arrives to play some music, and her off key voice is thankfully interrupted by a drunken painter who. Oh, wait, never mind. He's trying to apparently deflower the bar wench's daughter in front of everyone. So, when the drunken patron goes to kiss this girl, the Lark decides to immediately pummel him and four other drunken patrons, all of which are guys because, you know, we're dealing with strong, independent woman of color, you know the drill. Then we immediately cut over to Zintreya, which is the capital city of Zintreya. <laughs> the king decides to tour among the people to improve relations, despite known assassins from all other kingdoms in the area. And wouldn't you know it, he walks right down the wrong street and ends up in the middle of a mostly peaceful protest. Then Sarah Jessica Parker rears up and the princess falls off of her just as Fjall of the dog clan rides in to protect the king and princess from would-be assassins in the first of many hastily choreographed fight scenes. After that, back in the castle, Fjall of the doge clan goes up to speak to the princess and apparently they are an item. In secret, of course, as two fellow members of the doggy-style clan find Fjall and the princess have become the beast with two backs. Now, Fjall must suffer a great punishment. Banishment from Zintreya. After handing off his plastic prop of course, and then walking past some rocks. Well, I guess that doesn't seem so bad. I half expected him to become a eunuch, but hey, a victory is a victory, I guess. Back in Zentreya, the princess and her brother, the king, have a little chat that has nothing to do with the recent dishonoring of man's best friend clan, and she immediately mentions Solrith, an elven empress who was known for quelling a siege before building Zentreya where it stands. With her knowledge derived from the history of Zentreya and the countless history books at her disposal, Merwin, the princess, wants to be an advisor but her brother has other plans to marry her off to the widower king of Prisha. And of course, Crazy Eyes here is not enthusiastic about this decision. We know where this is heading. Then, after a brief and useless cut over to Michelle Yao in the middle of nowhere, we catch up with God. Damn it, it's Lenny Henry again. Is this dude on speed dial for terrible fantasy shows? Anyway, he plays Bellar, who we meet standing in front of the Obama monument and opens a portal and enters it to speak with a mysterious voice revealing he sent the assassins after the king and needs the voice's help. Jumping back over to Penis Rub, the wench's daughter is talking to the Lark and asks a few questions like where she learned to fight. The Lark mentions she was a protector from Raven Clan, which explains the voice. She left to become a bard because she liked music more than fighting, which is ironic because she was still willing to throw down with a drunken rapist from earlier, which isn't a bad thing, I guess, but it lands her in jail, where she meets Fjall, of all people. How quaint. I see the Witcher is not only still doing the same craptastic out-of-place storytelling from before, but now it has the escape velocity speeds of Rings of Power. The two then prepare to fight, and the Lark mentions Fjall took out one of her friend's eyes in a battle, and that she would 
kill him if they cross paths. Well, this group is supposed to work together later, so the script takes this possible rivalry and throws it out, and they sit down and have a chat. Yeah, so much for vindication. Anyway, moments later, some guards come in and Fjall gets ready to fight with them too, but to his confusion and mine, his freedom has been bought. Wow, just one coincidence to another, huh? Well, just when he's about to get up and bids the Lark farewell, she tries to take out one of his eyes in a brief attempt at a fight, and he justifiably knees her in the balls, and one of the guards breaks them up after their little spat. Back in Zentrea again, the king tells his advisors, one of which is Balor, and another is Aridin. Oh no. I might not know The Witcher 3, but I do know who the character is, and considering that we are 1200 years in the past, I'm willing to bet this is in fact the same King of the Wild Hunt, and based on what I'm seeing here, he's probably Athenian. Boy lovers. Anyway, the king tells the council a peace treaty will be attempted to end the Thousand Year War, more on that later. Before any real details can be gone over, we jump back to Fjall, meeting up with his buddy Shen, a fellow member of the Woofers clan and lever of fingerprints on charcoal. Anyway, Shen was the one who bribed the guards to get Fjall out of jail and informs him of the impending peace treaty, and Fjall's response is basically, don't care, go into a brothel. <laughs> Which is one of the most Witcher things I've probably ever heard. Heard. You know what? Good job. However, Fjall is broke like your average millennial, but offers his silver necklace that he only now realized is gone. Actually, let's go over that little fight, because I noticed something that didn't work. So the Lark somehow takes Fjall's pendant right here. When she uses it later, the chain is intact when she puts it on. Except, during the fight, he has it around his neck in certain shots, until the end when he magically doesn't. I mean, she literally pockets nothing right here, but Sure, Joe, sure, let's just, let's just pretend that you didn't have any extra shots for that. So the Lark took the necklace, which can apparently open locks, and she sneaks out and heads back to the tavern and finds not the wench's daughter, but her sister from Prisha playing her nickel harpa. Yes, it is in fact a real instrument, and one of the only things of Scandinavian origin the showrunners apparently have any respect for. Anyway, her sister has arrived to bring her back because of the peace treaty that's about to be signed. The Lark has a little cry about this because she doesn't want to kill again, despite having zero problem bludgeoning people not ten minutes ago and being ready to kill Fjall right after that. Then the wench's daughter comes in and has a stroke and tells her the main story beats of the plot. She even drops this line. The Lark's. Most precious notes shall be the key to all things. You know, just in case the diversity hiring wasn't on the nose enough for you. So the Lark, of course, decides to go back to Prisha. The Lark meets up with her sister, who is shot down by arrows just after she was named, because remember, we're supposed to care for these people. Then the Lark underhand throws two knives like 60 feet with pinpoint accuracy from a crouched position and attacks the assassins sent to kill her. She, of course, wipes all of them out because they're holding back as the Lark actress misses Q after Q. I mean, good lord, this dude who doesn't get hit literally hits the Lark in the mouth with the hilt of his dagger, and she of course takes no damage, but he falls over from nothing, by the way. Look, there's nothing here. 2022 really just couldn't have one halfway decent fantasy show, huh? Then this guy goes to attack and forgets how to use his left arm, gets stabbed a bunch, and instead of flinching, he just stands there staring at the actress waiting for his cue because even the stuntmen aren't very good in the show. Then the last stuntman, who clearly was standing there waiting with the death blow for a few seconds, gets chopped down by Fjall. The pair, investigating the bodies, finds that the group of assassins is comprised of warriors from all three kingdoms, meaning the treaty about to be signed is in danger, and Fjall, being the only rational one here, says they should travel together for safety, and the Lark agrees. Except her sister is dead, so now she's angry and is no longer the Lark. Now she goes by Eile. Back in Zentrea, the Princess Merwin gets an old Orary working by rubbing one of the cogs with tongs, because, you know, she does machines. And at the same time, the maid is trying to get her ready to meet her future husband. Fast forward to the night, and it's time for the ceremony. The king arrives, things look like they're going really well, and whoever did Merwin's makeup should probably be executed. However, shortly after it all begins, high-ranking guards and advisors from each kingdom begin walking away quickly, and Merwin looks ill, so she leaves the courtyard as well, and not one of the leaders from Derwin or Prisha call into a question. They just sit there and do nothing, like Medir, who is Merwin's future husband, seated silently, does nothing in the middle of a nation that until this point was his enemy. So 
know, all these advisors and his future wife leaving isn't the least bit suspicious. Oh, look, the doors are being locked. Oh, look, Merwin kills the guard following her, and a terrible 3D object descends from the skies and starts vaporizing everyone like it's War of the Worlds. Now, all the advisors from each nation serve the new Empress Merwin. Now, I might have been intrigued. However, I'm fucking lost. What exactly was the plan here? Doesn't killing the king who was about to unify the three kingdoms for peace just so that you can become the empress who unify the three kingdoms for peace seem a little retarded? You're all about your books and the history around you. You have at least 1,500 years of lore at your beck and call, and you never once stumbled upon a story, legend, or fable about deception, betrayal, or political assassination for selfish power grabs that inevitably lead to the death of the person who killed someone else for their own gain? No? Alright. So after everyone in the courtyard has been thoroughly powdered, we see Fjall and Eile are sailing for Gaelf, before immediately jumping back to Zentrea, where Merwin has become the new empress, believing herself to be the hero of her own story. Huh. An individual with main character syndrome that believes usurping the government that was about to make serious headway to improve the lives of others only to put in place a shit-tastic one that would regress the nation, making it worse for everyone involved and thus receiving the justified hatred she so deserves? Weird, it's like the writers just held up a mirror to their target audience, or am I having a stroke? Whatever, I'll figure out why I can't use my left arm later. Anyway, Merwin gets the idea to go down and meet her people, but the guards under Belor's command probably say, no. And it is only now that Merwin realizes she's a puppet? Really? Wow, if only you managed to read that book that actually mattered in all of this 1500 years of history you revel in that explained how tyrants fell. Huh, who could have guessed? Anyway, jumping back over to Gale, Fjall and Eile have arrived and pickpocket someone for coin for food. Sitting in the pub, the pair overhear some patrons openly mocking Merwin and the ridiculous turn of events when a pair of guards walk in and the particularly drunk and prideful patron calls these guards pathetic. You see, they're parading around in Prishan armor at the whim of the Zentrian Empress who was crowned mere sons ago? Wait, it was days? I gave them a month, but it was days? Are we kidding? Were they colluding on elf Twitter? How did three separate nations across an entire continent all fall over on their backs without a single flinch of resistance? And how do the common folk know exact details of this private event? The betrayal is spoken of openly among the citizens. There isn't even an attempt to hide what really happened? Oh yeah, almost forgot. Shit tier writing with a pace at ludicrous speed. <laughs> My bad. Any hooser, the guards are looking specifically for Eile and Fjall, of course they are, who have ducked out and get ready to go and find help to bring down Merwin. Back in Zentrea, Balor and Eredin oversee some workers who are standing up the Lenny Henry monument that somehow has been transported into the middle of the city and not already standing? Could have made it a little bit easier, but alright guy. Balor is unhappy that many more citizens than expected are not doing as they are commanded and orders Aradin to command the armies to persuade the people. That night, Fjall and Eile discuss what to do and declare a blood sworn to ensure that no one quits on this quest. Then we jump back over to Zentrea once again and we find Merwin talking with her maid about how she isn't happy to be Balor's puppet and wants to civilize the three nations. She also claims her brother's peace treaty would would only have paused the war briefly instead of end it, which is some of the worst reasoning I have ever heard. It wouldn't work because I said so, and that's why I killed him. You know, if it wasn't for her eyes, I almost wouldn't be able to tell the difference between Merwin and a true crime killer. In another tower, we meet one of the mages, Sindril, who is trapped in a room overlooking the master monolith. If the random scribbled mathematical formulas on the wall wasn't enough, based on Sindril's own statement, he is the reason for the monolith being erected, and Balor simply took advantage of him. Then we jump cut back to Fjall and Eile, who are wandering towards Zentrea, but they make a detour to find Eile's old swordmaster, Sian, the last member of the Ghost Tribe. Eile then says the Ghost Tribe was the finest warriors in all the land, until they were wiped out by the Zentraeans. Now apparently, the Ghost Tribe was wiped out after their water supply was poisoned? Wait one copywriting second! The Ghost Tribe water supply was poisoned, and their last survivor is a badass, almost samurai sort of warrior named Sian? Nope, pump the fucking brakes. 
If my Rings of Power series review did not prove that writers today have zero life experience, then allow me to make a very bold statement. The writers of Blood Origin not only are terrible at writing, they also blatantly steal from video games. In this case, Final Fantasy VI. Allow me to explain with a quick bit of knowledge. For those of you who do not know the old retro games, the long-running Final Fantasy series' sixth main title, and the best in the franchise, don't at me, it has a character named Cyan. Oh, well, that's just one little thing. Sure! However, he is a retainer of Doma, whose actual job or class in the game is Samurai. He is also the last survivor of the kingdom, as the water supply, a nearby river, was poisoned by the insane Magi Knight, Kefka. Now, if those parallels weren't enough, allow me to tie in the ghost part here. Shortly after Cyan joins the team, you enter an area called the Phantom Forest, and hop on the Phantom Train. One suplex later, you get off the train, and just before the party gets ready to leave the forest, the ghost of Cyan's wife and child, both victims of Kefka's poisoning, board the train and depart for the afterlife, hence the ghost part. So, with all of this said, I reaffirm my statement that writers today have zero life experience, and in fact so little they blatantly steal from video games they hope no one has played or remember. Furthermore, in the show, the two companions who cross paths with Sian are the big dumb muscle-headed Fjall, who is basically Sabin, and the sneaky knife thrower character, Eilie, paralleling Shadow. You know what? Modern writers is too vague given this context. <clears throat> Declan DeBara, Alex Minahan, Aaron Stewart on, Tanya Losha, Kirsten Van Horn, and Tasha Hyo. I have no care if I mispronounce your names because all of you fucking suck at your job. And I don't know which of you played Final Fantasy VI, but to disgrace that great game by ripping off one of its more tragic characters so blatantly only proves you fucks need to go outside and touch grass, you plagiarists. Now that the revelation is out of the way, let's go back to the unlikely pair as they cross paths with some refugees fleeing a town that actually did resist Merwin's forces. Ah, there's the world building I was hoping for. One of the women among the group recognizes Eilie and asks her to sing a song, but because Eilie is now consumed with angst like she's the Red Hood, and she refuses to sing her one-hit wonder, and so the group moves on. A little while later, Fjall and Eilie stumble on some traps and narrowly avoid one. Anyway, Fjall fjalls into a pit that unfortunately doesn't have spikes, and while Eilie is laughing at his misfortune, Sian appears out of literal thin air and catches them off guard. Back in the portal dimension, Balor goes to communicate with the blue cycle effect, mentioning he will never be accepted as emperor because he's, you know, lowborn. Could have fooled me, but then again, this show has the subtlety of Paul Pelosi's drug dealer, so Bellor asks this not Daedra for some chaos to put him above everyone else, which the voice agrees, but only if he's willing to make a sacrifice. Shifting back to the middle of nowhere, Eile and Fjall try to convince the plagiarism to join them in bringing down the Empress, and entices the deal with the chance to retrieve her stolen weapon, Soul Reaver. Cyan with tits says it isn't possible, especially when traveling with the enemy. Now with his feelings hurt, Fjall then leaves the tent with his tail between his legs and distracts himself by touching his dagger with a bad glow effect applied to it and touches it to the absurd makeup on his side. Eilie then walks over and gives him an herb, and they touch hands, then give each other a look. Yeah, sure, let's just forget that she tried to turn Fjall into Dan Crenshaw not 20 minutes ago. Anyway, Sien comes out of her tent, and Eilie tries to convince her one more time but she refuses and antagonizes Eile and Fjall, and apparently, smacking someone with an empty scabbard is enough to knock them down flat. If this is the case, it is a wonder the backwards fall into the pit didn't leave Fjall looking like Mr. Glass. Obviously, Sien is testing these two skills, and if I were Sien, I'd have just packed up and left the fucking continent. Eile is swinging wide with knives like she's wielding sledgehammers instead of stabbing with them, you know, because they're stabbing weapons, but hey, whatever. And when Fjall swings his axe, he looks like a drunken lumberjack. Look at this, Fjall touches air and is deflected back as Sien rolls forward with a wide shot and is clearly further away from Eilie when she tries to sweep her leg and misses by a mile. And of course, Fjall just stands there waiting for his cue instead of going for a kill shot. Seriously, go in and bonk her like the horny police. She'll give you her blessing. All right, never mind. He tries to do so with the hilt of his little tyke's axe and misses like a stormtrooper while Eilie just stands there having finally stabbed forward, then gets spun around 
ground, and Fjall somehow loses his axe, and everyone just stops and stands there in disbelief. And of course, to no one's surprise, Sian chooses to go with the useless pair, but not before torching her campsite in the middle of nowhere so that no one can fast travel to it. And there we have it, the first episode of four in a miniseries that does to the Witcher fandom what a room full of Balenciaga execs would do to an orphan. You can really tell the care the showrunners have for this series and the world it takes place in when Yaskir's actor, Joey Beatty, can't even be convinced to get on a treadmill. This is only one of many, of course, but the first major issue that popped out at me is the writing, with Yaskir's first line squeezing in more fucks than Hugh Hefner could in a day. Oh, fucking, 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 fucking. This is the kind of dialogue you'd hear from a child after they read their first Punisher comic. You almost can't go one or two paragraphs without someone cursing, and a little more than that if you count fucks. Then you've got the issue of character choices, which baffled me like Merwin's choice to kill her brother so that she could rule. You know, not to beat a dead horse that owed me money again, but Merwin really is the embodiment of today's younger generations. She's so focused on specific achievements by an old historical character she claims to be inspired by and yet knows nothing of what that individual was like besides those specific accomplishments. Solrith building Zintreya and then quelling a siege is all that she knows. She doesn't know how she ruled. There's no mention of her politics, how she governed so many people, whether she was beloved or not. I feel like if anyone asked Merwin about Solrith building Zintreya, she wouldn't know if it was through unity or force. And let's be clear, I don't need to know this, but Merwin should. If she does, then she's just a power-hungry lunatic who ignores the lessons of the past. If she doesn't know, then she's an inept moron who shouldn't be taken seriously as a threat in the first place. So the idea of her wanting to be an advisor is baffling when she can't even finish reading the books that she so covets. And speaking of history, the lore is something else that bangs my balls like off-roading in a jeep. So let me set the record straight real fast. My only knowledge of The Witcher is the underwhelming first season of the show and the horrendous first game. And while I know tidbits about the other ones, like Aridin from Witcher 3, not much else. Carrying the cross that is Blood Origin makes me want to learn more about the world because you aren't given one iota of geographical positioning in this world. Where is Zintreya? How about Darwin or Prisha? Eh, not a clue. There is a better chance of Geraldo Rivera finding Jimmy Hoffa's body than a point of reference in this show. Now, if you know anything about The Witcher, you probably already know this. I didn't. So when I opened up the Witcher wiki to understand any of these references, it turns out that 90% of this show is made up. This is shit-tier fan fiction. Eile, Fjall, Zintreya, Prisha, Enos Dub, and Gaelth. None of it, none of it, to my knowledge, exists in the Witcher books or games. I went digging, couldn't find anything. If you are going to put in some amount of effort to create a story with this many original characters, locations, etc., then why not just make it your own show? Ah, yes, I almost forgot it's easier to hijack a popular franchise to force politics down the throats of the masses than it is to create something original. And that's so ironic to me, since so many of these characters and locations are original. For as bad as this project is, some of the basics are there. You could have made a miniseries that while much of we've probably seen before, it could have been original, but you just couldn't resist, could you? The last pin holding this thing together is gone now, and all of a sudden you feel that it's alright to just destroy everything? Yeah, okay. It's just like the action, you couldn't give a damn to put in any real effort. Case in point, one of these social dick suckers tried to sell the action as... The action is... If the actor's timings weren't bad enough, the gap between the actors looks like the Chicago Bears' pass coverage. If you want me to believe they are actually fighting, you need to have them practice the fights longer than a few days. Corrections should have been made for moments such as Eile stealing Fjall's pendant. There wasn't a take in which she had the pendant in hand you could have used instead of this? Really? And while I've never thought Michelle Yao was spectacular, man, is she wasted here. It doesn't help that she's older than dirt and can't quite keep up with the younger actors like she used to, but the younger actors here have no idea what they're doing. And don't think this doesn't include the choreography either. Fjall's actor has few 
fewer credits to his name than there were dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, but there is no excuse for him to have missed the hilt to the back of Cien's head this hard, unless the choreographers said to. And this is just the first episode. There are three more of these things to get through, of course, but I'll save those for the next episode, which I'm going to take in stride, because this show is so bad that even the critics on Rotten Tomatoes have seen the light. Man, I really missed making fun of these shit-tier shows and movies. It's good to be back. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.